Um, right, so the title of my talk is Large Scale Human Behavior um, Mining with Mobile Phones. Um, and so, just to introduce the topic, how many people, put up your hand if you know that your mobile phone is tracking your locations, for example. So everybody knows. So put, it, put up your hand if you didn't know that. One person. Um, but <laughs> okay, then. So about six or seven years ago, actually, most people didn't know this. Um, and so this, this, I, this whole idea was really novel. Um, and, and so that, that's actually when I started doing this research. Um, and, and so I personally believe mobile phones are a really powerful tool um, for research in computational social science. Um, and why is that? Because almost everyone across the globe has one. Um, it's completely ubiquitous. There are multiple sensors that simultaneously sense your activity. Um, and a mobile phone is a good potential source for ground food collection um, through surveys. And um, it's also a rich data source for dynamical study. So in understanding individual and collective dynamics um, and changes over time and looking at unusual events and so on. So what are the limitations? So, um, so I've done some work on detecting depression, for example, with mobile phone data. And one of the, what I think is probably one of the biggest limitations is when you just look at the data, a human cannot actually determine, um, for example, based on a mobile phone data source, whether that person has depression or not. So if a human cannot do it, um, it's very difficult to train a machine to do it. Um, and the reason why a human cannot do it is because the data is very complex. So there are multiple sources of complexity. There's a lot of noise inherent in a lot of the data sensors. Um, the data is multimodal. There's a lack of effective visualization techniques for this data. So if you have a accelerometer data, for example, how do you effectively visualize this in order to determine if somebody has depression or not? Um, and the continuous time nature of the data makes it complex. Um, and there's a lot of redundancy and there's potentially a large amount of irrelevant data. Um, so those are the major complexities that still need to be overcome in order to make this data source potentially more powerful, I believe, um, for research in computational social science. So an overview of my research. Um, my research generally falls under two different categories. So um, I'm interested, obviously, in mobile phone data. And I'm interested in machine learning, so applying different types of models for modeling this data. Um, and I'm going to present some of my work in this domain. So I'm going to present um, a model that I've come up with um, for a particular act, uh, um, uh, for activity modeling, basically, for discovering routines from, from mobile phone data. Um, and another sort of branch of my work is looking at different applications. So how can mobile phone data be used for different applications um, that might be useful to humans. Um, and one of the applications that I'll talk about today is um, epidemics. So looking at simulating epidemics over mobile phone um, Bluetooth interaction data. So I'll present some research that's done here. Um, I've also looked at agent-based models a little bit and depression, as I mentioned earlier, but I won't present those results here. So the first work um, falls under the machine learning category. And it's done in collaboration with Daniel Gettica Perez in Switzerland. Um, he's a professor at UPFL. Um, and what we're doing is we're, we're mining patterns, basically, from this data. Um, and these patterns correspond to routines. And what I'm presenting here is based on location data. Um, but we've, we've actually are also applied it to other uh, sources of data. So we've applied it to interaction data as well. Um, and so the work I'm presenting here is on two different data sets. Um, and the first is um, the MIT reality mining data set, um, which is probably one of the first data collections that was available to researchers to look at these sorts of um, topics. So many people will prob probably know this data set. It's available um, to download. And the data contains it's for 97 users over a nine month period. And the location, so uh, the work I'm presenting is just looking at the location data, and that consists of cell tower connections, basically. 
Um, and a second data set is the Lausanne Nokia data collection. Um, and this has over 100 users over 1.5 years. And this has GPS. Um, so location is expressed in terms of GPS. That's how it's collected. So here I'm visualizing um, both of these data sets, actually. So this isn't the complete data set. This is just one person's data. I think it's probably my data. Um, from the Lausanne data collection. So these are representations of location. So on the plot with four different colors, this is the cell tower connection data. And basically, uh, cell towers are categorized as home, work, out, or no reception, with, which corresponds to the different colors. So a color corresponds to sort of a semantic location. And each row in this graph is one day of a person's sort of how they move about throughout a day. And there's 48, 30 minute time intervals in a day. So that's what's plot here. Um, so you can see there's about 3,000 users um, data plot here. Um, not 3,000 users, 3,000 days of um, pattern. And on this side, um, this is just one user's data, but the, we're mining much more. Um, and this is GPS data, and how GPS is represented is we, we do some pre-processing on it to find what are called stay regions. And stay regions are if a person is in a particular location um, for more than a period of time and they go back to that location um, frequently, then that's called a stay region. So every unique color corresponds to a different stay region, and the white areas mean um, there was no stay region. So it's not um, um, like a, a routinely visited place. And there are some errors in, in the code that was running on this. As you can see, there's a lot of white in this data. Um, so what we're trying to do is to mine patterns from this data. And we're using unsupervised machine learning um, approach to do this, because we don't know what we're looking for. So we're using latent topic models. Um, are people familiar with latent topic models? A few people. OK. And. Um, so some of the issues that we address in this work is how do you handle noise? So there are different sources of noise. So we want to be able to handle um, slight changes in time and duration when, when we're mining um, patterns. And we want to know, uh, we don't know the duration of the patterns we're looking for. So how do you handle that? Um, and how do you validate what, what you're doing? How do you validate whether or not your model is working well? So I'll quickly um, present our approach to this and the model that um, we came up with. Um, and if you're interested, I have many papers on this um, on my list of publications on my web page. Um, so basically, you have uh, location data and that's pre-processed um, in, in a fashion that you can then use latent topic models. And, and I'll describe what latent topic models are in a little bit more detail. And then latent, basically the output of these models are what um, we hope correspond to routine. So sort of patterns of location activities. So when I explain a topic model, then hopefully what we're doing, this whole picture will make more sense. So um, basically topic models search for topics in a corpus of documents. And it's done, um, it's basically used on text data. So if you have a corpus of documents, um, it'll discover topics. And topics are distributions over words and, distribu and uh, categorized as distribution over documents. So say you have a corpus of journal papers, then it might find a topic that's computational social science, and then how that will be. Um, Discover basically it does a distribution of words, and then it'll also give you a distribution of topic, uh, documents given that topic. So that's sort of how it works. And it's a dimensionality reduction technique. So say um, when you're talking about text, then um, the, dim the dimensionality you're dealing with is every unique word in your corpus. So maybe the number of words in, in the English vocabulary, if, if your corpus is big enough. Um, and then your dimensionality is reduced to however many dimensions you specify into the model. So you have to 
um, pre-specify that value. Um, and so basically that's how the model works. And this is um, the graphical model. So we're, now I'm talking about um, models that are applying to documents, but how do we sort of make an analogy with location data? Um, so what we do is we say, what if a document were a day in the life of a person? And what if um, a word were a location? And we also add um, some time information in, in that um, location. Um, so, so basically a word corresponds to a location or a sequence of locations and some sort of time information. So that's how we make an analogy. And then um, the, the model will hopefully discover patterns. So basically this is LDA. Um, and, and we propose the distance n-gram topic model, the distance n-gram topic model, which, which is an extension of LDA. So LDA, the way it models a document is this um, W corresponds to a word, and Z are the latent topics that are found um, by the model. And here what we're doing is we're extending that model um, to allow for a sequence of words because we want to find sequences of um, locations that correspond to patterns and um, and so what we're th what we were really interested in doing is allowing this model to discover long sequences of activity so traditional ngram models every element in the sequence would depend on every single previous element and that doesn't allow you to sort of extend to a long sequence because um, it would just be too computationally intensive. Um, so what we do here is we relax the assumption and we say that every word in the sequence only um, um, depends on the first word in the sequence and the topic and the previous word in the sequence. So we have a really relaxed assumption um, in the sequence information and that allows us to find long duration sequences. Um, and it also allows to have some noise within those sequences. So um, this is the distant n-gram topic model. Um, and how we validated it was to run it on synthetic data first. Um, so how we did that is we defined six different topics. So these, these are very simple topics. Um, you can see there are 10 possible locations. and um, the durations are either six or eight or nine. So we have a mixture of durations of, of the sequence. And then we generate a document by sampling from um, this data. And then we run the distant engram uh, topic model with, we, we use 12 as a sequence length. Um, and that's just arbitrary because we didn't know the length of the sequence that we're looking for. But we're, we're just curious to know what it will do. And it's interesting to see that it did actually find all the different sequences. So the different colors correspond to different probabilities. Um, but you can see that this sequence is found within this topic. And this sequence is found within this topic, and so on. So they're all actually found within the topic. So it looks like the model is um, working. And, and it did find both length six and length nine sequence. Um, and this is really, this is initial work um, that's, that's been done. There, there are a lot more directions that we could look at with this model. Um, and so I'm presenting results that were found on the GPS data, um, but it worked on both um, data sets. So here are some of the topics um, that were found from the GPS data. You can see um, these I think it's the 10 most probable days given given a topic. And you can see um, sort of clusters of locations uh, that are found. So th these are sort of corresponding to um, uh, location patterns, basically. Um, is this clear? So here is a representation of many more topics that were found in this data. Um, and again, so the different colors correspond to different stay regions, so they're different locations. And the x-axis is the time. 
So, and each row is a day. So you can see these are all the different patterns um, that were found with this model in this data, um, which isn't really obvious when you look at that individual uh, person's GPS data at the beginning, that there might be some interesting patterns in the data. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Topic modeling, the number of topics is a theory of right? Yeah, you specified it. Yeah, well, how did you come up with that? Um, we, I mean, you do it, we do it heuristically. There are certain equations that you can solve to find the optimal one, or you can plot the perplexity and see when, how that changes over time. But, I mean, here, basically, when, when we have too few topics, then topics start looking the same, and if you have too many topics, then they become redundant. So you can sort of eyeball it by just looking at the patterns that are found, and we're not really trying to optimize that number here. So we're just experimenting with the model to see if it works here. Um, so now I'm going to present um, the work we did on epidemics, and this work was done in collaboration uh, with Manuel Sabriano and Remy Emlinas. Um, and what we're doing is we're simulating epidemics over mobile phone data. Um, and the data set um, that we use is the MIT Social Evolution data set, and this was collected by Anmol Madan again in Sandy Pentland's group at the MIT Media Lab. Um, and it's available to download this data set as well. Um, what makes this data set really interesting to use for epidemic simulations is that it has um, Bluetooth data. So 72 participants, they're all undergraduate um, students at MIT, they were asked to keep their Bluetooth on over a nine month period and they were asked to record their daily flu symptoms over a 17 week period. So it's a rich, power, rich data source um, for studies in epidemics. Um, and, and so here are how people responded to the survey questions on flu over a 17 week period. Um, and this is just weeks 15. Yeah, I should have started this graph one. But, um, so basically they were asked these four questions. Do you have a sore throat or a cough? Uh, runny nose, congestion or sneezing, do you have fever, or do you have any um, vomiting, nausea, or diarrhea? And this is how people responded over um, the 17 weeks. And when we're doing the epidemic simulations, basically we assume that if they answered yes to any single one of these questions, then they, they were considered to be ill. And so that's what we're, we're looking for in the simulations. What's yeah. the granularity how often? I think it was on a daily um, okay. basis. Okay. Yeah. And it was after the present tense, not have you had. I, so yeah, it was uh, yeah. present tense. But I mean, there might be a bit of error in terms of when they answered. So they might, I, I don't know exactly if, if they might have answered right away, but. This is the type of question where if you change it from the present tense to the past tense, you could change the answer. Yeah. Yeah, but these the, these were the exact questions. No, I, I appreciate that. So, that's, yeah. that's why I'm yeah. making sure you're not paraphrasing it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so one of my students actually made a demo of this data, but um, I'm going to skip over this. Um, it's just a visualization of the data. Um, and so this work was published um, in CSCW recently. Um, and so what we're doing, basically the motivation is how do you incorporate um, a standard model that's used in epidemiology um, into this network scenario where you actually have real data. So how do you sort of combine those two? Um, and we're interested in, to know how well can we predict the total number of infections in this real data over time, over the 17 weeks. And we're also interested to know how can, how well we can predict the actual person that became infected. And as far as I know, this hasn't been, I haven't seen any other papers that are trying to do this. And the reason why we can do this in this data is that it's very, um, it's a very specific data collection. Um, so this is the SIR model that's used in epidemiology. It's a very standard, um, 
model, basically every individual can be in one of three states. They can be susceptible, infected, or recovered. And when they're recovered, then we assume they cannot become infected again. Um, and there's a probability beta and gamma for cha state uh, changes. So we have this model, but how do you apply it to this real data scenario? Um, so what we have in terms of data is we have these networks. So we have we, we assume we have four different scenarios. We assume we have a homogeneous model, a heterogeneous model, and we assume these occur on either a daily basis or a weekly basis. And we're sort of playing around with these different models um, and model parameters to see um, how well we can actually predict the real data using this very simple model. Um, so in the homogeneous model, um, uh, basically a network's drawn either on a daily basis or a weekly basis and a link um, occurs between t two individuals if a Bluetooth interaction data was recorded between those individuals either within the day or within the week um, and these links are not weighted in the homogeneous case. In the heterogeneous case these links are weighted and they're weighted based on the amount of um, interaction that these two had based on the number of Bluetooth um, connections that were stemmed, uh, that were recorded between these individuals. So, um, yeah. Do you, do you take into account the diversity activity patterns when you're worrying about your heterogeneous model? Because you're assuming the Poisson dynamics that you don't. And we know it's not Poisson dynamics. Um, so, if, are we assuming first the activity? So no, 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 no. I mean, I'm taking that into account in your choice of weighting. Because if you just if you just add up the number of interactions, that's for assuming for assuming Poisson temporal dynamics, which is not going to be correct. Um, we might not be. So we're we're sort of normalizing um, the the total number of interactions. We're just normalizing it. So maybe we're not taking it into account. Which is why actually in the end this model doesn't work as well. Okay. <laughs> so that could be crazy. <laughs> But, um, okay. yeah, maybe I'll ask you afterwards how I would take that. Well, I mean, I would actually do a temporal network for collapsing it in the first place. It's already problematic. <coughs> okay. Um, yeah, so I think I've described these two models. Um, and so this stochastic process that we simulate, basically um, what we're simulating is a c uh, continuous time implementation of the SIR model. So what that means is that we sample the next time at which a person changes state. So for every individual, we sample the next time that they're either going to become infected or that they're either be going to become recovered from infected. And whichever one happens earliest, we assume that state changed. And then um, and then we we um, re-simulate the scenario. So I think I am considering I am considering what you said because of the way we're simulating um, the actual changes in epidemic. But the network that we consider doesn't consider it. I'm, I'm talking about the contact patterns. If you, if, yeah. if, you, if you only take an aggregation from just summing the number of contacts, that is assuming a Poisson type of dynamic for the contact patterns as opposed to having a bursty dynamic um, Never mind. Let's, yeah. Let's um, so, so anyway, this is how we actually simulate um, the dynamic, and um, we assume a thousand random trials um, for every case and run the, run the simulations, and we plot the average over a thousand um, simulations. So, this blue line actually shows the real the ground truth. So we're we're trying to um, get the closest results in this blue line. And the best performance for the heterogeneous case is plotted in red, and the homogeneous is plotted in black over the, the 17 weeks. So you can see the homogeneous model most closely um, um, achieves the actual results, and, and these are the best model parameters that we found. Um, and both models perform better on a daily basis compared to a weekly basis. 
So um, in terms of predicting who became infected over time, um, these, these results are still really, um, we didn't look into them in too much detail, but basically what we found is that we could achieve a precision of nearly 30% over the 17 week period. So this graph is an average over 17 weeks for different model parameters. Um, so it's the average precision. And what actually happened is that over the 17 week period, um, so with it, at the first week what we do is we say, we take from the real data who, the indiv who were the individuals that were infected, and then we actually try to predict who became infected over time. Um, and we found we could predict very well at first, and then as time progressed, the errors propagate, and that's why the overall performance is low. Um, but this is something I'm interested to look into a little bit more. Um, and the second work in epidemics um, that we've done was published in PLUS One, um, and it's doing contact tracing. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too much de detail um, with this work because it, it gets really complicated to explain, but um, basically what we do here is we, so contact tracing is done for cases like um, Ebola or HIV, where if you know somebody becomes infected, then you trace that person's contacts um, to try to prevent, um, to limit the effects of the epidemic. And what we're doing here is we're we're doing contact tracing based on mobile phone call records um, to see if we can pre um, prevent, limit uh, the effects of the epidemic on this real data using contact tracing model. And we assume that um, the network, so what we're doing is we're simulating the, the epidemic over the Bluetooth interaction data. We're doing contact tracing on the phone call network. And we're assuming that you can never fully know um, the network over which the epidemic is spreading. So, so we assume that um, when we're simulating the model and we find that um, contact tracing based on call records actually does help improve um, the effects of the epidemic on, on, on this data set that we have. Yeah. So you're in reference to what? Yeah, to not, not doing contact tracing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, in conclusion, um, I've looked at um, unsupervised late latent topic models for activity discovery and location data, um, and also other sources of data. And I for forgot to mention that one way that this work was also validated was doing data prediction. So, one way to know how well um, the sort of topics that you're discovering work are if you can use them to predict data, and, and we've done that as well. Um, and we developed the distant and ground topic model for secret discovery um, based on mobility data. And I've considered various scenarios for epidemic simulation over mobile phone data. Um, so for future work, I'm interested in exploring new applications of mobile phone data relating to the social sciences and health, particularly, um, and to develop new models or extensions of models uh, which can be applied to this data to potentially better tap into the sorts of data for a wide range of applications. Because I still think the sort of killer application um, that can that mobile phone data can be used for is still still not there. Um, questions? Thank you.